classic drum machine sounds like the Roland TR909, 808 and 606 have shaped the sound of electronic music for decades. And still to this day, so many producers, when they start a new track, they immediately go for a 909 sound or the likes to start their track to kick off the drum sounds. I think there's nothing wrong with it except for one thing. Actually, 909 sounds can sound quite boring on their own. And so let's fix that today. In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how you can identify great sounding 909 samples, separate them from the weak ones and give your track the foundation that it needs. And I'm also going to share with you my favorite way of processing 909 sounds so that they actually get a little bit of character and fit the vibe of your genre. Now, before we get into this, if you struggle with finishing music currently, I have something for you. It's a free guide called the Finisher Framework. It shows you three simple steps that you can use to finish at least one great sounding song per month. You can get it simply by going to pickyourself.com framework. The link is in the description. And yeah, I hope you get a lot of value out of that. So first of all, what makes 909 sounds so special? Well, I personally think that they just have this extremely robotic vibe Plus, you can customize them quite a bit on the machine itself and even in the plugin emulations. But I think the biggest problem is that on their own, these sounds still sound a little bit boring and lifeless. And so they almost always need some kind of processing to really stand out and cut through in your mix. Now, if you're like most producers, you probably don't own a classic vintage TR909 drum machine. And that's totally okay. You can still get the benefits of these sounds. I think most emulations these days actually do a pretty decent job. I also think there are a lot of great samples out there, but there are also a lot of weak samples out there. And the first step I think is to decide like, what do you actually want to get out of this and how do you select the right source that then fits your track? So let's jump into Ableton and just take a look. All right, so first I will show you two different stock samples by Ableton. I just picked some that sounded quite different to give you an idea of what the variety actually is. So this here is the first one. versus this one here. Now, when someone tells me, yeah, I like to use 909 samples for my drums, well, what do they actually tell me? Basically nothing, because the variety of samples out there is just so huge. And as you can hear with these two examples, when you listen to the trends and it's like how much of that snappy original, um, yeah, sound is coming through and how much of a tail is then left and then also what type of overtone characteristic do both of these samples have like you see and you listen to so much variety in the sound itself that it's almost breathtaking that this is considered the same thing so um, let's compare this now with a couple of other options out there there's actually one sample provider that i personally think is doing a really great job it's uh, samples from mars um, shout out to these guys and I think they have created a really nice collection of 909 sounds with a huge uh, variety there. And by the way, I'm not affiliated in any way. There's no like affiliate link or no sponsorship. This is just directly me um, liking the thing. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview. I picked basically uh, the same, same type of hit and just tried out a bunch of different variations that they offered for these types of hits. So first of all, let's listen to a clean one here. So really snappy, I think, nice transient information. Um, it, I can see this work really well in a lot of different genres, but especially for the more, yeah, maybe more pounding type of techno sounds, probably really good sound. Now, let's say you produce more something like house music or electronica, something more mellow. Then I think you should try out some of these variations. So for example, the tape saturated one sounds like this. Clean again. Now let's go to some of the other ones. There is a tube one as well as as some um, as well as some colored ones. So colored just means they used a ton of outboard processing on top of the whatever tape or tube recording. Let's uh, flip through these to give you an idea of what's about to come. So I will start with clean and then move my way up the ladder. So 
as you can hear, like there is so much difference between the individual hits and I think starting with something that goes in the right direction is always a really good idea. Now, personally, I would stay away from some of these super colored ones like the last two, simply because I think you, at the beginning of your production process, you cannot really know how much saturation and how much overall overtone structure you still want in your drums because you don't know what's yet what's about to come. Yeah? So if you create a ton of synths and uh, layer them together, it might be possible that nothing from your original kick drum will be left from your beautiful distorted kick drum. Whereas if you end up with something super sparse, where there's like a lot of room, I think you still have the possibility to display these overtones in the signal. But you don't know yet at the beginning of your production unless you have like a super clear idea where to go. So I would personally start with something a little bit cleaner, a little bit more punchy, and then kind of figure out along the way how I want to shape the sound. And this is the second aspect that I want to show you now. So step one was to select the right sample that is not overprocessed on the one hand, but still goes in the right direction and leaves a lot of possibilities and opportunities to shape the sound. But the question is, how do we now do this? Now, instead of just slapping a ton of effects directly on the sound, I prefer doing it in a parallel chain. And with parallel chain, I mean like either using a send return channel or you just um, duplicate the track and on the second duplicate version you put on your effects. Now, why do I do this? I think that it just leaves a little bit more room to experiment on the way without limiting you completely. So you always have the, the nice transit information, the punch of the original raw signal, and you just add in as much effect to taste as you want. So let's take a look at what this yeah, might sound like. So what sample are we using now in our session? Well, I personally don't want to use anything that is too distorted like this one. But I also think that something super clean like this one here has just a bit too much click sound. I don't really like it. So I would settle on something like this here that has a little bit color, but yeah, still is kind of clean and punchy. So this has a nice balance between the overtone characteristics, but still the punch and impact. So I think this is like a really good solution. So I will clean up the session now, just uh, delete the tracks that I'm not using here. And we'll just stick with this one and then create a duplicate version that we can then use to process. I think a good um, opportunity is to use a little bit more distortion and maybe also a little bit of compression. Now, I don't use compression as a mixing effect here. I really use it as a sound design effect. Generally, I'm a big fan of separating the production and the mixing stage. But here, if we want to, for example, lengthen the tail of the sound a little bit, it's a good idea to use a compressor and also abuse it in certain ways and then feed the signal back in. So let's try that out. So now I've soloed the parallel track here and we will slap on a compressor here um, I'm a big fan of the standard Ableton Glue Compressor. There's like a ton of options in my arsenal, obviously, but I just like this one way more than the standard Ableton Compressor. And also, I think, even if this was designed to work on buses of instruments, meaning like complete groups, I think it still does a great job um, if you like, really push it and abuse it in certain ways. So I'm like obviously overdoing the compression a little bit. The ratio is gonna be quite high at four to one. So some people would not say this is high, but as a trained mixing and mastering engineer, I think this is quite high actually. And uh, yeah, attack time is already quite quick. Release time, we will make this even longer. So let's see. Now I want you to listen to the change in sound. It's really, it's really obvious how we are lengthening the tail, but also adding a little bit of overtones to the sound just by the nature of this compressor. Let's check this out. Now 
Now on this own, this would be completely overprocessed and I would not like this in my sample. But I think if you feed this uh, in into the original channel as a parallel chain, I think this works quite well. We'll see this at the very end, I will show you. Now the next thing that we want to try out is adding a little bit of saturation in an interesting way, a little bit of character. So let's try that out. All right, so we'll work with the simple Ableton saturator and see what this can do for our sound. So here the Ableton saturator, obviously there are a ton of options of what type of saturation or distortion curve you want to apply here. Now if you want to go for like really heavy, hard, industrial type techno sounds, you can definitely go for something like this hard curve here or the digital clip, so it would sound like this. But if you want something more mellow, then you can go for this like analog clip or a soft sign or medium curve. This would be the options for like more housier styles of music. I will now actually go for something a bit more extreme. Let's try out this hard curve once again. So this is adding a ton of overtones. It actually destroys the transient pretty much. But this is exactly why I like having a parallel chain because yeah, it gives me these options to sneak as much of this in as I want. And I still have like full control over the clean path of the original signal. And I have full control over this distorted parallel path. So what else can we do? Maybe a little bit of colorful EQing can also be nice. And by the way, I would maybe stop at this point in a real session, maybe even before, maybe the glue compressor would be enough. But just to give you an idea of the palette of things that are available, let's try out a colorful analog sounding EQ emulation. So one of my favorite emulations for analog style EQs that give us a nice overtone structure and maybe add even more harmonics is the Tube Tech Collection by Softube. Doesn't really matter if you don't have it, there's also um, free emulations out there for classic Pultec EQs, you can definitely use them. Now, let's go for example for this like um, equalizer collection, which means we have our top bands here, our low end here, and the mid section down here. By the way, if you want to use this type of EQ, definitely check out the manual because there are interdependencies between the bands. You have to know which knob correlates with what setting and only then you can really make sense of it. But let's say, let's now listen to this first of all and think about what do we even want to do with this EQ. So I can imagine adding like a little bit of a yeah, nice, nice top end to this that maybe the original clean signal doesn't have as much because we went for one that doesn't have too much click. That's still kind of, yeah, it's still punchy, but we can might maybe get a little bit of interesting overtone structure going on top of the saturation that we already have here. So we'd go to the top section and yeah, basically it's a relatively sharp cue um, and boost it and just see what type of setting makes sense. So I really like the grittiness that's coming out here. I would maybe make it even sharper, the Q setting. So Q is the width of the EQ. That brings out very interesting overtones. Now, in a mixing and mastering setting, this would be completely insane to go for a setting like this. I would never do this, like very, very few cases. But um, for this type of sound design EQing, we can definitely do this and get away with it. As we're working in a parallel chain, we still have all the options. And yeah, in terms of the low end, you can also extend, for example, the low end quite heavily. Um, I would not go as deep as here, maybe around the 60 hertz mark, if you want to push the fundamental tone of this kick drum a little bit. Let's do it. So this should do. And then if you, for example, want to um, increase the punch a little bit, that like punch that you feel in your chest, then you would maybe go for the midsection and dial in, let's say here, 200 hertz. 
So it's not too much there here. You maybe have to go a little bit lower, like uh, 120, something like that, which is not available here. It doesn't really matter. You can also shape the curve over all of the sound a little bit. So for example, dip out a little bit of that lower mids to make it even more, yeah, I would say even more impactful on the low end and still have like the sizzle on the top end. So maybe around 500 Hertz, dip it. So this is giving you like a smiley curve with a dip in the middle. So maybe something like this. So this obviously sounds quite different from our original signal. So let's feed that back in and see what happens. All right, how do we do this? Very simple. We just deactivate the solo. We bring it down completely like the parallel chain. And then we let the original signal play and feed as much of the parallel chain in as we want in terms of taste. Let's just try it out. Yeah, so this is what I would do here. This is more or less the setting that I would start with. And the cool thing is it leaves us a ton of options later down the line. When you are now in the very end stage of your production or already in the mixing phase, you can still fine tune the balance between the two and you always have your original source signal 100% available. The um, original 909 sound that is a little bit too boring but still has a lot of impact and clarity. Yes, it's already there. And then your palette chain that it's maybe a little bit over saturated, distorted, compressed. Um, but you have this at your fingertips and can decide how much of it you want to feed in just to add a little bit of character. All right, that is it for this video on how to spice up your 909 sounds. I hope you found it helpful. Leave a comment below and let me know how you are currently processing your drums. What are you using in terms of samples? How do you go about treating them with things like compression, saturation, other effects? Let me know in the comments. I would definitely love to hear from you. And don't forget to grab your free download if you want. There is a free resource that helps you finish more music. I would like you to get to finishing at least one great sounding song per month. So go to pickyourself.com slash framework and I'm happy to help you over there. So that's it. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in another video soon.